Good morning. I'm just going to wait a second until people take their seats. What a wonderful morning we have for this. Welcome to Coffee with Cody and the Catherine Fleming International Development Award, now in its 17th year. I'm June Weber. I'm privileged to be the director of the Cody International Institute and one of the vice presidents here. I want to uh, extend a very special and warm welcome to George Fleming, Katie's dad, who is uh, from the class of 55. Where's George? Good morning, George. And, and George Tudorine, who can't be with us here today, Katie's mum, but we are recording this, so, uh, so she'll have a, a clip of this. Katie's nieces, Annie and Sarah, are you here? They, oh, there they are. Okay, so from the... Uh, also St. Evex grads, Annie here to, in a nursing degree, getting her second uh, degree from St. Evex. Katie's family and good friends, welcome all. I want to start by acknowledging that uh, we are on the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This is Treaty Day in, uh, in Nova Scotia, and we're very proud to be flying the Mi'kmaq flag. I don't know if Alan Silvoy is here this morning with us. Did Alan come? No. Alan is our... our um, Cody Chair in Social Justice, a very well-acclaimed Mi'kmaq artist who will be on campus for the next two months in that role. So, this is, uh, this is my first coffee with Cody. And you can well imagine when I heard about this award, I, I thought I'd better find out who Catherine Fleming was and what was behind this award. So I spent some time over the course of last year meeting with Katie's folks, meeting with her good friend, Dave Bernacci in Calgary when I was there. And yesterday I had the honor of meeting George, her brother, from the class of 92, and her very good friends, uh, Jim Kenny and Kevin McGilley, here from the class of 1986. And you'll hear from Jim in just a moment. The, uh, so I learned quite a lot about Katie. Clearly, this is a young woman who was inspired by Jimmy Tompkins and Moses Cody, who were the protagonists of the Antigonish movement that ignited the spirit of social and economic justice throughout this region and around the world. Katie was the first St. Evex woman graduate to be awarded a Rhodes Scholarship and studied in economics in Oxford through that Rhodes Scholarship. She, uh, she became the assistant to Stephen Lewis and, and here George and Doreen had a really fun story about how she saw that Stephen Lewis was being appointed to the UN ambassadorial role in New York. She wrote him a letter uh, expressing why he should hire her to be in the position of assistant. Stephen passed the letter to his wife and partner, Michelle Landsberg, who said, you had better hire this woman, and he did. <laughs> Katie then uh, dedicated her life's work to overcoming child poverty in Africa, making her career at the United Nations Children Fund, UNICEF. She was posted in Tanzania, where she uh, passed in May 1999, leaving her husband, John Zutt, and three young children, Madeline, Nicholas, and Alexander, who are now 24, 22, and 19. So Katie brought an exceptional spirit of inquiry. She, was, uh, she had a genuine interest in justice and fairness, and, and she was a driving force for personal and political action. I think that she was a force that was at times disruptive, who people noticed and they paid attention to, and they, they worked with very carefully throughout the course of her time here and other places. And for that reason, the Catherine Fleming, the Catherine Fleming International Development Award was established to continue to build on Katie's legacy by her family and her close friends of Saint, her Saint Evex classmates from 1984 to 1986. Each year, this award offers a full scholarship to a, a woman diploma participant from Africa who has dedicated their life to overcoming child poverty and improving the economic condition of women. The, uh, importantly, the funds that are awarded through the scholarship are leveraged by matching funds from the Government of Canada through Global Affairs Canada. So that's a truly significant gesture in that it enables two people to benefit from this education. So today, I'm very pleased to congratulate Sipiwe Mabuya Kulu as the 17th recipient of the Catherine Fleming International Development Award. So, um, 
Before I, I leave the podium, I wanted to just share with you some of Katie's words that I came across as I was preparing for this. And as I'm speaking to a number of alumni, you'll know that you've, uh, you're all asked to, to talk about your experience at St. of X, and hers was published. And she wrote, St. of X has given us more than know-how. It's introduced us to questions that are of fundamental importance to us, both professionally and personally. We've been encouraged to scrutinize our deepest convictions, to reevaluate our oldest and most trusted ideas. And it is from this self-examination that we develop a perspective on all we've done at St. Effex and all we have yet to do. Of course, the, most, the real test of our education, the real test of our friendships, lies in the future. It lies in the choices we will make, and it, uh, it is, will manifest itself in the help we continue to give to one another, help to change what needs changing and to preserve what should be preserved. So what a wonder, wonderful and prophetic statement by Catherine herself. So uh, with that, let me introduce and welcome the uh, 18th president of uh, St. Francis Xavier University from the class of 1986, Dr. Kent McDonald. Good morning, everyone. Class of 86, 30 years, remarkable. Um, on this beautiful day, let me just welcome everyone back to our campus, of course, the Fleming family, uh, in particular, George Sr., who had the joy of staying in my hometown of New Glasgow last night, uh, I understand. Uh, of course, the Fleming family alumni returning uh, to this campus, uh, faculty and staff, uh, friends all. This is always an important moment in uh, our homecoming weekend. Uh, I will, last night I had the opportunity to share just a little bit about our new strategic plan. And in, uh, in that interwoven is a commitment for us to even further deepen the links between St. of X University proper and Cody. And, um, and so, although Katie will be recognized here this morning, I wanna shift just for this one day my sights uh, to colleagues of Katie, that it is remarkable that uh, for over 30 years since they have graduated and, and uh, Katie was here, that for some reason uh, they continue to find uh, the friendship and the memories uh, and the way to honor her by coming back every year. And I see them sitting out here in front of me. Uh, this is an example, a perfect example of how we should continue to make these connections between the beautiful work done and the amazing people here at Cody and the university. So, of course, this morning we honor Katie, uh, her legacy and the impact that she has had. We do that in the ceremony, uh, through the award and through her family. Uh, but on this day, I just wanted to personally recognize in a very public way uh, Katie's friends who, who keep uh, that, uh, that spirit alive with us. Welcome back to St. of X, uh, everyone. It's going to be a beautiful day. And uh, again, the Fleming family, thank you so much for coming back to the university. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Jim Kenny. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, Kent, uh, I'm going to actually even get a little bit more specific. Uh, I think it's really important that we recognize a, a couple real movers uh, behind this award, and that is uh, Dave Bernache and Kevin McGilley. Uh, for the last uh, 15, well, actually 17 years now, they have worked tirelessly uh, to promote this and to do the fundraising and to strategize around it. So um, I, I think we should give them all a Uh, this is a real honor to be able to speak about Katie, and, and um, I feel a little bit, I, I must say, um, uh, sheepish about it, because whereas Dave and, and, and uh, Kevin uh, kind of kept up with Katie very closely in the years after graduation, I, I, she and I, uh, although we, we kind of knew what each other were doing, uh, we kind of, as families and careers grew, we, we, we kind of uh, you know, lost contact. Um, but I knew her very well for about three years, and, and so um, I'll, I'll share what I can, uh, because I, she was a very impressive person. 
I, I only come to homecoming every five years, but um, when I do visit, this ceremony is the highlight, uh, both because it recognizes an old friend, but also it links this institution with something much bigger. And, and I think Kent was talking about that last night, and, and I'm really glad to hear that we're going to continue in those directions. Um, Dr. Weber has kind of given us a, a thumbnail uh, outline of Katie's remarkable life. I'm going to add a little co color commentary to kind of flesh out a few things, just so you, you know her a little bit better. Um, born and raised in, uh, in Thunder Bay uh, from a, a very close, tight-knit family. And, and Katie talked about that, and, and I know that very much influenced who she was. Um, she excelled in high school, and something that most people don't know, she was a, uh, a competitive swimmer who at one point uh, held a, uh, a provincial, uh, Ontario provincial record uh, for her age class. Um, when she came to St. Evex in 1981, she came to study the dismal science, economics, and, uh, and uh, what drew her to that, though, I think, was this interest in international development. And I know her thesis uh, focused on those issues. At St. of X, uh, she was very active. Uh, she got involved in student government. Uh, she uh, was on the executive. I think we all agree that uh, Katie could have been the student union president. But Katie was always a person who liked to work behind the scenes. And uh, I think there's at least two presidents uh, and at least a vice president, who may actually be in the audience right now, who, who perhaps uh, were, were tapped on the shoulder by Katie at one point. Um, early on, as I say, she exhibited this interest in, in international development, uh, certainly her, her work in economics, but also I remember um, she got involved in Crossroads International, and she went to Belize one summer, and, and she came back and gave a number of talks uh, and, and really kind of, I guess, opened a world to a lot of us. Uh, and so she, this, this interest in international development goes way back. Um, she graduated in 85, as, as, uh, as Dr. Weber was mentioning, she went off to, to a spectacular career, uh, went to Oxford, met her husband, uh, who would become her husband. Uh, she uh, then uh, you know, went to work for Stephen Lewis in, in Toronto and then followed him to uh, uh, the UN in New York uh, when he became the ambassador for HIV AIDS. Um, she worked, she did a stint as a UN uh, d development officer and then uh, spent, uh, I guess, about seven years as working for UNICEF, uh, holding increasingly uh, positions with increasingly more responsibility. It was a remarkable career. But personally, I, I guess I would say that uh, I got to meet uh, Katie during my first year. And um, this is one of these things where uh, I, I came from a small rural town in, in, in Nova Scotia, and I did pretty well in, in, in high school, so I came in with thinking, you know, I, I was all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> and and uh, uh, of course, what happens when you come to a university is you quickly learn uh, that there are smarter people out there, <laughs> more accomplished people, and, uh, and, and Katie was that person for me. Now, don't tell Kevin that. He thinks it was him. <laughs> but I, I got to know her in a strange way because uh, we, the model parliaments here at, at St. of X were, were, were really kind of a, a big thing. Uh, uh, Senator John Stewart organized them. And, uh, and, and in my first year, I got involved. I was very excited to get involved. Um, uh, Katie, not surprisingly, uh, was sitting on the NDB side. Um, I uh, was uh, a young Tory, <laughs> and I was going to say a passionate, but I think really the proper adjective is I was a rabid young Tory. Um, a little embarrassed to say. I was <laughs> cocky, and I was self-confident and self-assured, and I was soundly thrashed in debate. <laughs> it was not my last lesson in humility at Katie's hands. She really was brilliant. She was an excellent debater, and actually I learned a lot about debating from her. Um, she was, and the thing about her was she was articulate, um, she always had a plan, uh, but most importantly is that she was always well prepared. Uh, there she, um, 
she, I, I learned from her never to bring a, a knife to a gunfight. She was, she was always prepared. She was, and especially on those issues that really mattered to her, issues around social justice, inequality, um, she, uh, she had the, the facts and she was ready to go, so. But against all odds, we struck up a friendship. We were both interested in politics. We both liked to debate. And over the next few years, we talked and argued over many issues at the sub and at the inn. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I, at, at best, I amused her. At, at worst, she tolerated me. Uh, but actually, we did become quite good friends. Um, more often than not, the debate ended with me grudgingly acknowledging uh, that maybe she had a point. Uh, and ultimately, in fact, uh, she played an important role in, uh, I would say, my political education. Uh, and and I, I would say that I learned as much from Katie as I did from any of my professors here. And it was just that kind of interaction, uh, you know, kind of, of, of sitting in the sub and arguing. And that's who Katie was. Um, all of this sounds, well, kind of serious, and, and Katie was that. She was serious, but I, she also had a fun side, and I think it's important to understand that. She loved to laugh. Uh, she enjoyed going out with friends, and she was known to bust a move on the dance floor. Um, that's as much as I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Her nieces were after me last night to find her. Um, but in preparing for today, um, I reread the incredible address given by Katie's then eight-year-old daughter, Madeline, in 2000. I was struck by a couple of Madeline's observations. First, she mentioned her mom's boundless optimism regarding Africa, and in particular, particular the role uh, of women in ameliorating social and economic problems. I remember that optimism when she was an undergraduate. There was no problem that could not be solved. All that was required was hard work and imagination. She was an idealist, but she was very pragmatic about how, how to go about it uh, in, in achieving that ideal. Madeline also mentioned how much St. of X and the Cody Institute had meant to her mom. It convinced her, Madeline said, that working to help the poor in Africa was the best thing to do with her life. I remember conversations with Katie where she said as much. How she found the idea of the Cody Institute, how she found the idea of St. of X so inspiring. But I would submit that as much as St. of X meant to her, she meant even more to St. of X and the people she came in contact with here. Many of us came to this place from small towns or rural areas with a worldview that was very small. Our concern was the local community, perhaps our province, the ambitious people thought about in terms of nation. Katie's horizons were much larger. Before there were departments of global studies or development studies, she encouraged us, her friends, to think of the world as an interconnected whole one for which we all had some responsibility. Katie enriched the St. of X experience immensely and contributed to the idea of this place as an outward-looking institution committed to social justice. So, in closing, I think if we think that this is very much part of Katie's legacy, this what she brought to the St. of X idea, I think we should also kind of recognize that she also had a personal legacy. And, and usually at these uh, uh, talks, uh, we, we, we provide a brief update of what's going on with Katie's children. So if, you, if you'll allow me just briefly. Uh, her daughter, daughter Madeline, uh, recently graduated from the University of Toronto with a Bachelor of Arts in International Studies. She's currently working for a think tank and is uh, planning on going to grad school. Um, Presume, or she, she thinks in international studies. Nicholas, he was just recently accepted by the US Peace Corps uh, and he's about to take up a two-year position in Uganda. 
Her youngest son, Alex, is currently studying uh, English literature at the University of Toronto, and Kevin tells me that he, uh, he has aspirations of becoming an author. So as Kevin told me, uh, the family business of doing good continues. Her legacy is also uh, reflected in this award we are about to give today. And, and so uh, it, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce to you um, C.P. Wei uh, uh, and, and to uh, congratulate her on this award. And I have to say, just by, by, by editorial comment, last night uh, we, we, uh, we dined together and I have to say uh, this is a remarkable woman who, um, it, she was telling me the work that she was doing and all I could think of was Katie. I thought about pragmatic idealism. And uh, I think this is a, I, I'm, I'm so pleased that we can uh, 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 offer this award to uh, C.P. Wei, and I congratulate her, and I look forward to your comments. My name is Sipue Mabea Kono. I'm coming from Swaziland. On behalf of women, groups, girls, and children I work with, I wish to express my deepest heartfelt appreciations to the family, friends, classmates, and community of Katrin Fleming for creating the Katrin Fleming International Development Award which has recognized the work I do with women and children in Swaziland. My, appreci my appreciation also goes to coding international institution that has given me the opportunity to come and study the development cause. This, is, this has uh, this have, uh, made it possible for me to attend this course, this course, and it has given me the opportunity to speak to the world about the work that I'm doing. This is a profound, important milestone in the history of my life in Combustion and Swaziland. It is indeed, it will bring a complete paradigm shift in my own life and those of the women and children I work for. The vision of Compassion and Swaziland is in, in which there is justice and healthy lifestyle for all children and youth in Swaziland. Our mission is working as an advocate for children, releasing them from social, physical, and economic poverty through collaboration and partnership. As we work toward achievement of results, our goal is to contribute to the process of restoring hope and dignity of HIV positive adolescents and they have a free generation from HIV in the Kingdom of Swaziland. The background of Swa Combustion and Swaziland. Combustion and Swaziland was founded by concerned HIV mothers and fathers in back 2010 and it was legally registered in 2011. The HIV positive mothers and fathers were concerned about their children that were born with HIV and approaching adolescent stage. Their concern was also about their children that were not born with HIV but in adolescent stage. And then their concern was how to protect them or to prevent the children born with HIV to infect the children that were not born with HIV. And also their concern was based on how can they help their HIV positive adolescent to continue with life regardless of their HIV situation. The objectives of Combustion in Swaziland is to integrate sexual and reproductive health education and HIV prevention. 
We provide sexual and reproductive health education to in-school and out-of-school adolescents. We also provide sanitary pack, which we call a dignity pack. It has um, a sanitary pad, a package of sanitary pads, soap, uh, lotion, and vaselina. And then we also educate girls on menstrual management. We also have uh, adolescent big endeavor where big endeavor is a big story where we bring adolescents together at regional level once in a year where they can share their the best practice stories. They share their challenges and then where they share how they can overcome their social and economic situations challenges. We also prevent we also provide uh, education on gender based violence. In Swaziland, gender-based violence is also a key driver of new HIV infections. It's around bullying. And then most girls, especially those who are coming from the rural areas, have normalized the bullying from boys. And given the cultural norms and values, a girl has no say over a boy. And then our intention in this, we are working with schools, the centers of care and support, to provide this uh, gender-based violence education. As Compassion and Swaziland, we believe that if uh, we educate boys and girls at a younger age, yes, they can change their behavior. We also provide care and support of children, women, that are living with HIV and AIDS. We form and conduct women's and children's clubs in schools and women, is, uh, women and children is a support group in the communities. We also give parental capacity building on HIV dis status disclosure to children so that uh, the mothers can tell them their HIV status. Where I'm working, we are implementing our activities in the rural remote communities of Swaziland where women and children don't have access to information on issues of HIV and also sexual and reproductive health. So the women had a challenge of telling their children about their HIV status. It's not easy. I will give you one example. Another day a woman came to the women's group. She shared with me, CPUA, I'm just from home. My daughter was asking me, Mommy, what is this medication for? And then the mother said, I want to be true with you, my daughter. So the mother also was taking her medication, antiretroviral therapy. So she thought bringing the, the, the drugs in front of the child was going to help. And then she said, my daughter, I'm also taking the medication. This medication, we are taking it because we are HIV positive. And then this child was told in school if you, they were told about HIV issues and then they were told that you have to abstain so that you, get, you don't get the virus. She was indeed an HIV positive adolescent. She didn't understand. She could not understand her mother. She started to fight with the mother. How come mama? I'm HIV positive and I'm a virgin. Then she started asking about her siblings. Is so and so ahead of me, HIV positive? The mother said no. And then she asked, why? The mother said, because by the time she was born, I was not infected with the virus. Then the story continued. The daughter asked, mama, so and so that is coming after me. Is she born with HIV? The mother said no. And she said, why? The mother said, because when she was born, I was aware of my HIV status, and I went through the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. So the child asked, so mama, out of all your children, why did you decide to infect me? She had no answer to give the daughter. Then the mother said, I didn't know that I was infected with HIV. I never would go through the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. So that's how we were infected. Then these adolescents started to 
fight with the mother and eventually she stopped to take the medication. So we are also providing a community mobile clinic. Since we are working in the remote rural communities, where clinics are about 35 kilometers away from the community. So, and then the level of poverty is very, very high. So it was an idea for Combustion and Swazen to bring the healthy services closer to the people so that they can access HIV testing and counseling, so that they can access, women can access family planning. And also, we are also advocating for medical voluntary male circumcision for boys in our culture. That is not known. So, but then it can also help the young boys to prevent HIV. We are also doing threatening household for economy to improve the lives of women, door to door visit. And then also food security. Swaziland currently is, uh, has faced, um, was, is hit by drought. And then the worry is about our children that are living with HIV. Most of them are coming from child-headed household, elderly-headed household, and then they are coming for vulnerable families. So we provide food parcels for them every month so that at least they can have something to eat and then take their medication. And then we also conduct activities with community leaders so that we believe that if we get the buy-in of community leaders, they can support our work that we do in the community. Currently in the community, community leaders are having weekly meetings where they are covering issues of HIV prevention and sexual and reproductive health. And then the successes of Compassion in Swaziland. More women have job in my community and youth. We are working in my community, that's where I started the, the work with Compassion. Mortality rate uh, has reduced for women and children. Traditional leaders refer their clients to the clinics. Community leaders has a session of healthy programs in the community meetings once a week. And then we also have the buy-in of men in HIV prevention and family planning. We have improved the economic status for women that is benefiting the household through handcraft and floor polish. So here we are using the resources that are, the available resources in the community, like grass. We use grass to produce chicken nest. And then chicken nest, everyone in the community needs them. And then with this project, uh, it has gone uh, for a long mile since uh, there is a launch near where we are. And then I went there to advertise the chicken nest. And then the director of the lodge said, oh, CPUA, these ones are too big. What if you, you, you produce small ones in the size of a bird so that uh, tourists can come and buy them? And yes, he said, okay, it is easy. And then I went back to my community. And then we are producing chicken nests that are very, very small. I would call them bird nests because they are very, very small. And then in that way, we are getting more money uh, to improve the social and economic status of the women and children in my community. A takeaway home. Since I'm a founder and director of Compassion and Swaziland, for a long time, I thought, I know what these women need. I know their needs. I know the needs of the children. How I said, I will do everything. I would write proposals for them. I would plan for them. And then I would come back and say, oh, this is the funding that you have today. It's for A, B, C, D, F, G. And then yes, they are happy because it's uh, improving their life. But then since I came to coding, through the Cartoon Fleming Award, my thinking has changed. I will involve the women in planning, in everything that I, I intend to do for them, for the sustainability of the project, so that even if I'm not there, they can still continue to do the activities. And then 
the other thing that I've learned here is that uh, accepting the person, the people, the way they are, not being judgmental. At one point, I looked at myself as I was here. I said, okay, uh huh, where do I fit? <laughs> and then my coming to Kony has given me this opportunity to give people uh, the opportunity to express themselves the way they are, to respect people, the values of other people. And yes. And then I will share the information. I will educate young women so that they can be leaders of tomorrow, so that they can stand up and fight for their rights. As I'm working with the community, rural communities who have normalized the situation of poverty, who have normalized that this is how they were born, who have normalized if they were born poor and they will die poor. They don't want to fight for their rights. They are fine. This is how God has created them. So with the skills and knowledge that I've acquired here, I'm going back home just to strengthen them so that they can stand up for their rights, they can fight. They, this is their right, human right. To the Katrin family, friend, and community, it is always a pleasure to have a club coach in the caliber of a personality like Katrin, where women and children issues were in the center of her heart. I am rest assured that her mandate will be carried over to the next generations to come. Thank you.